Hello and welcome to World Today, and this is also our special coverage of China's Shenzhou 14 mission. Now, this China's uh, space ship has successfully lifted off from the Zhou Transcellulist Launch Center in the country's northwest. This is China's first manned mission this year, with a three-person crew expected to complete construction of China's space station. Now, Li Jingyi has, has more. At 10.44 Beijing time this morning, the Long March 2F carrier rocket lifted off in northwest China, carrying three Tigernauts for a six-month stay on China's space station, the Tiangong. The launch of the Shenzhou 14 comes just less than two months after the return of Shenzhou 13 crew in April. This is the third manned mission since 2021 and the first manned mission in the second phase of China's space station construction. Before the launch, a send-off ceremony was held at Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center for the three Taikonauts. The crew are Chen Dong, Liu Yang, and Cai Xuzhe, with 40-year-old Chen as the mission commander. He once participated in the Shenzhou 11 crewed spaceflight mission and Liu, of the same age with Chen, became China's first female astronaut in the Shenzhou 9 mission. Tai, born in 1976, is a newcomer to space. The three Taikonauts will work to complete the construction of the Tiangong space station, with the basic three-module structure consisting of the core module Tianhe and the lab modules Wentian and Mengtian. Shenzhou 14 is the first manned mission during the construction phase of China's space station and has great significance. During the six months mission, the Taikonauts will test nine different formations for the assembly of the space station, change the capsule position twice, and conduct five dockings and three separation and evacuations. They will also coordinate with the ground to complete the construction of the space station. The crew will do two to three spacewalks using a combination of airlock module and big and small robot arms. They will, for the first time, enter the Wentian and the Mengtian space labs to unlock and test more than a dozen of experimental boxes. In general, they will undertake extremely difficult tasks. I should say, this is the most difficult part of the construction phase. Late in their mission, the trial will rotate with the Shenzhou 15 crew in orbit which means six Chinese astronauts will live and work together in space for a short period. The Shenzhou 14 crew is expected to return in December. Li Jingyi, CGTN. And a journey on a space rocket is compared by some to a car ride. And our reporter Sunya tells us about the China's Long March 2F carrier rocket and a ride it offers to Shenzhou crew members. The Long March 2F carrier rocket is an old-timer. Its development started in 1992, and it has been the carrier for China's manned space missions all along, including this time sending off the Shenzhou 14 crew to China's space station. Rocket designers say its technology and manufacturing process have changed over the years, but the goal has always been the same, lifting the crew into space safely, smoothly, and comfortably. So comfortable that the ride is compared to a ride on a highway in a Mercedes-Benz. People think astronauts feel strong vibrations during a rocket launch, but when the Taikonauts are inside, they don't feel it much. We have taken a series of measures to cope with tremors caused by propellant flowing, the engine burning, and the rocket going through the atmosphere. We have staggered vibration frequencies from the rocket's structural frequency, therefore reduced the rocket's vibration. The Taikonaut seats also absorb shocks. This Long March 2F carrier rocket that carries Shenzhou 14 crew has been ready since last year, acting as an emergency rescue mission for the Shenzhou 13 crew. And now, another Long March 2F carrier rocket is also in position as Plan B. As we work on the Shenzhou 14 mission, we also make preparations for the Shenzhou 15 mission. There's only 50 days in between. So we've optimized the response time and transition process. 
And that is crucial for future missions because when China's base station enters the operation stage, more crew members will take long march rocket rides to their home in space. Zhu Ye, CGTN, Beijing. And China says three Taikonauts have been sent off with the hopes of the nation, including its Olympic athletes. China's short track speed skater and Olympic gold medalist Wu Dajing sent his best wishes from Zhou Chuan in Gansu before the liftoff of the Shenzhou 14 crew. We athletes are here to be inspired by the fearless spirit of the space crew. Their predecessors are dedicated to the aerospace industry and some of them have been dedicated their lives. When we were competing at the Beijing 2022 Winter Olympics, these space heroes cheered for us. So today we came to see them off and send our best wishes to them. And for more discussion, let's bring in our guest, Yang Yuguan, professor in China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation and vice chair of IAF Space Transportation Committee. Uh, hello, Professor Yang. Welcome back to the studio. What's going on? Uh, what is going to be uh, our astronauts' daily routine on station and what factors go into planning day-to-day -day life in orbit? Uh, well, for the Shenzhou 14 crew, actually speaking, they got the experience, very useful experience from the Shenzhou 13 crew. Uh, so the daily life will be, uh, there will be no essential difference. But you see that their tasks will be quite different. You see, as your colleagues have already mentioned, there will be nine shapes or nine configurations during their flight. First, you see that before the arrival of the Shenzhou uh, 14, uh, the Tianzhou 3, uh, Tianhe 1, and the Tianzhou 4 uh, forms the I-shaped configuration. And then with the arrival of the Shenzhou 14, uh, it will add it to the bottom of the uh, Tianhe 1. And then uh, the Tianzhou 3 will be deorbited, uh, detached from the station and deorbited. And then arrival of the Tianhe uh, uh, module, uh, first to the front docking port. And then it will be transferred uh, to the side bursting port from an L-shaped configuration. Uh, and then uh, comes to the uh, Meng Tian module, first to the first front docking port, and then transferred to the side bursting port, a T-shaped direction. Then will be the deorbiting of the Tianzhou 4 and the arrival of the Tianzhou 5 uh, 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 cargo ships. Uh, then uh, finally, arrival of the Shenzhou uh, 15 crew. So you, you can see that there are nine shapes or nine configurations, so complex. So, uh, and also the arrival and the rendezvous of four spacecraft. Very, very complex. So their tasks will be very complicated and challenging. And you mentioned about the Wentian and Montian lab modules, which is the brand new names for us. And those two modules will be sent into space this year and become the central working areas for astronauts in orbit after uh, the China Space Station is finished. So how is the process going now? Exactly. You see that uh, to construct the station is not simply connect the three modules together. As you already asked, there are many tasks uh, to do. For instance, we must combine the uh, power supply, the communication, the data handling, thermal control, and all these systems integrate into one system. So there are many tasks for the astronaut, for instance, to install and test the uh, and the uh, and the uh, debug of the uh, racks inside the uh, Wen Tian and the Meng Tian module. Also, uh, and also mounted something, some devices outside the uh, modules, and also adjust something outside module, like the adjusting the uh, the height of the uh, panoramic uh, cameras, uh, similar like that uh, being done in the uh, Tianhe core module. So all these kind of work can be recognized as part of the construction of the station, and all of them are very, very important for us. And Professor Yang, the docking process is about to start at any time. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about us, the whole process? Um, I think um, after, the launch, uh, after the launch of the rocket, the this, uh, this spacecraft has been um, taking every minute to, to chase after the space station. Now, where is the, where is the spacecraft right now? Well, you see that we adopt a faster rendezvous and docking. Uh, mm -hmm. According to the uh, announcement this 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 morning, uh, the initial orbit of the Tian, uh, Shenzhou 14, uh, the perigee is about uh, 200 kilometers, and the apogee is about 360 kilometers. The inclination is uh, the same as the station about. 41.35 uh, degrees. Uh, so this uh, orbit is lower than the uh, station uh, because it is lower and it is rotating the Earth faster. So it is a chasing vehicle. Now it is already uh, very close to the station, but we should emphasize that docking from the nadir or the Earth-facing docking port is much more difficult than docking from the front or on the uh, from the rear part because essentially speaking, uh, in a different attitude, it is in a different orbit. So the relative position is quite different and also not 
stable. So the algorithm approaching the station, uh, comparing with the, approaching that from the front or the uh, from the rear part is quite different. And we already test this technology completely from the Shenzhou 13 mission. Although we mastered that, but it is really challenging. That's right, and, and we've been talked, uh, we've been told a lot about this uh, this uh, the Ranivore technology called radial autonomous fast Ranivore and docking technology. Well, tell us uh, more details about this technology. Why are we taking this approach to docking with the core module? Uh, uh, you see that uh, you know that there are three docking ports uh, on the Tianzhe exactly. One core module: uh, the front, the back, and the Nadia docking ports. Uh, but we test this technology since 1911. Uh, we sent, we launched the uh, Tiangong One target vehicle, and we performed the Shenzhou Eight, Nine, and Ten missions uh, to perform both the automatic docking and the manual docking. As we have discussed, uh, discussed previously, uh, each uh, each measure can be recognized as a backup of the other. So uh, in these kind of uh, procedures, because until today, for all capa space capable nations, although it is already very practical for U.S., Russia, and China, but still it is very Risky. So to have a backup measure will be very necessary to ensure the success of a mission. So this time, uh, not only for the approaching of, as you mentioned, for the Shenzhou spaceship, but all the other uh, cargo ships and also the uh, lab modules, uh, we use both these measures. But for an unmanned uh, spacecraft like the Tianzhou or the Wentian and the Mengtian, we must uh, perform the manual docking with a remote control mode because the astronauts were not uh, sitting inside this uh, spacecraft. So the remote controlled uh, uh, manual docking, we must uh, test that before. Uh, we do that actually see during the Shenzhou uh, search mission and it is also a key technology and very risky the russia do have some disasters before the progress m34 collided with the mir space station due, during this procedure but although it is very risky but we uh, still need that let's talk a bit more about the wind tian module uh, which will be uh, which will be launched later about and it was not only for scientific research cabins but also will carry out with uh, some backup systems and also uh, with new airlocks. So why do we need this? Exactly. You see that our uh, space station will use uh, for about more than 10 years. So the reliability is one thing that we must consider about. So to have the backup or redundancy of the major functions of the core module of Tianhe is very, very necessary. So the uh, uh, the Tian module also has the attitude, attitude control systems, uh, the control moment the gyroscopes, and also we have another independent in, uh, environmental control and the life support system on board the Tian, uh, Wen Tian module. Uh, also with three other chambers for the uh, as bedrooms of the uh, of the astronaut also provide them as a private space. Also another toilet and another kitchen. So all these are very necessary, especially during the handover of these uh, different expedition teams. Moreover, as you mentioned, the main airlock is located in the Wentian module because you know that uh, the uh, the uh, the node in the uh, located in the core module is used as an airlock during the Shenzhou 12 and the Shenzhou 13 mission. But that's only a temporary uh, measure uh, because you know that uh, then during the EVA, the uh, airlock is in the vacuum condition, so it isolated the living quarter and the other part of the station. So uh, it can only be used as a backup measure in the future. Uh, usually, if there is no any malfunction, we will use the uh, main airlock uh, on, in the Wentian module. On the other hand, the airlock in the Wentian module is larger and more comfortable to be used. For instance, the hatch, the size of the hatch is one meter, while the hatch in the, uh, in the node is only 0 0.85 meters. So it is bigger and also more convenient for us to perform EVA. Thank you so much for your insight. That's our uh, Professor Yang Yuguan, Professor in China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation. Appreciate it. And China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi's final destination during his eight-country tour was Timor last day with a stop in the capital city of Dili. On Saturday, he met the newly elected President Jose Ramos Horta. Um, Wang Yi said China is willing to carry out more cooperation to help small and medium-sized countries speed up their development. He said China will continue to stand by developing countries. Timur Leste said it looks forward to learning from China's experience and tapping the potential of bilateral cooperation. Our reporter Dong Xue brings her analysis.
The South Pacific is turning into a new competition ground with the U.S. and its allies trying to boost their presence to match China's growing influence in the region. And that rivalry has become fiercer since last month when Chinese State Councilor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi went on a 10-day tour of the region, visiting eight countries including the Solomon Islands, Fiji and Tonga. As Wang was busy landing a slate of agreements, the U.S. was trying to rally support against China on the other side of the Pacific. Just as Axios writes, all of a sudden, a region with fewer than 700,000 inhabitants became ground zero for U.S.-China competition. This March, China announced a security pact with the Solomon Islands, an agreement that has raised concerns among the U.S. and its allies, especially Australia, about a possible China Chinese foothold. Senior White House official Kurt Campbell immediately rushed to the Solomon Islands and warned that Washington had significant concerns and would respond accordingly to any steps aimed at establishing a permanent Chinese military presence there. Former Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison also dispatched a senior diplomat and described the pending deal as a great concern. Despite a flurry of warnings, Solomon Islands Prime Minister Minister Sogvari said the deal is not about what the West is concerned about. It's not about establishing military base or a permanent presence of, of Chinese forces on the ground. It's about addressing the you know, the security needs like this are when, when times of disaster. We will need the support of all our developing partners, in, in, including, including China. If there's a riot here and we cannot handle it uh, locally, we will need all our friends to come on board to, to help us. Beijing's interest in the Pacific became clearer by a series of agreements signed after the second China Pacific Foreign Ministers meeting, chaired by Wang Yi. After the meeting, Wang announced that China will build new platforms of cooperation with the Pacific Island countries to help them tackle climate change and poverty, foster development and improve disaster prevention and mitigation. Wang said some question China's intentions in the Pacific but Beijing is also supporting developing countries in Africa, Asia and the Caribbean. He also stressed that Pacific nations are sovereign and independent states are not anyone's backyard. By comparison, the U.S. footprint in the Pacific has faded away since World War II. There was no U.S. embassy in the Solomon Islands, for example, for almost 30 years until earlier this year. They also contributed only 10 million U.S. dollars in development found to the whole region in 2020. Like one scholar said, I'm always shocked that in Washington, they think they have a significant presence in the Pacific when they just don't. It seems like what China is offering will help Pacific nations address some of their very urgent concerns, like climate change and economic recovery after COVID. So to counter China's efforts, the United States will have to increase its engagement with the region and offer deals that directly benefit the people of these countries and brings them development, prosperity and security. South Korea's Joint Chief of Staff said on Sunday that a Democratic People's Republic of Korea fired eight short-range ballistic missiles off its east coast. Downhap News Agency says it's the 18th projectile launched by the DPRK this year and also the third since South Korean President Yun Suyu took office on May the 10th. On Friday, U.S. Special Representative for the DPRK Sun Kim met his South Korean and Japanese counterparts in Seoul amid signs that DPRK is preparing to conduct its first nuclear test since 2017. In the United States, a rally started being held to remember thousands of victims of gun violence as part of the Wear Orange weekend. The events come in the wake of multiple tragedies, including the Uvalde school shooting that left 19 children and two teachers dead. The Wear Orange movements began almost a decade ago after teenager Hadia Paddleton was shot and killed in a park near her school in Chicago. Banji Heyer has more. It's Wear Orange weekend. This is one of many events taking place across the United States to pay tribute to victims of gun violence, which kills 110 people every day in the U.S. These commemorations happen annually, along with National Gun Violence Awareness Day. But this year, they come off the back of the worst school shooting in a decade, one that's shaken the country. 
As the 19 elementary school students murdered in Yavaldi, Texas were being buried, a man killed his doctor and colleagues at a hospital in Tulsa, Oklahoma, having legally purchased a firearm just hours earlier. It's time, says the president, to do something. We need to ban assault weapons in high-capacity magazines. And if we can't ban assault weapons, then we should raise the age to purchase them from 18 to 21. After a racially motivated attack in Buffalo, New York that left 10 dead, local politicians did amend state law so that only over 21s with a license can buy semi-automatic rifles. In the House of Representatives, lawmakers are debating similar legislation on a federal level. Yet it'll need Republican support to pass in the Senate. And here's what Democrats in Congress are up against. So this gun would be banned. I hope the, gun, the gun is not loaded. I'm at my house. I can do whatever I want with my guns. Whilst progress stalls on Capitol Hill, Americans aren't waiting to make their voices heard. Thousands took to Brooklyn Bridge to raise awareness. Other rallies are planned in cities like Washington, D.C. On the outskirts of the Capitol, as part of the Wear Orange weekend, families gathered in a local park to share their grief and call for stricter gun control to tackle the constant stream of gun violence shattering their neighborhoods. Those of us that live in this community, we're expo exposed to what I call collective trauma because we hear gunshots every day. Uh, we're dodging bullets. And despite the urgent calls for substantial action, the crisis has only worsened. There have now been more than 200 mass shootings this year alone in the United States. That's about 10 a week. And guns are the most likely cause of death for children in the US. It's left people with a sense of fatigue, numbness, resignation. But even amid the recent spate of shootings, nothing will change. And this uniquely American cycle of senseless tragedies will go on and on. Benji Hyer, CGTN, Washington, D.C. The mayor of the Kiev says no casualties were reported after several explosions hit the city early Sunday as Ukrainian forces pushed back Russian troops in severe old Donetsk. There are reports that air raid sirens could be heard across the country. Moscow also claims uh, to be making gains, citing Ukrainian forces as making critical losses. The governor of the Luhansk region says the Russian forces are blowing up bridges to prevent Ukrainian bringing in military reinforcements to this area. Russia has concentrated its forces towards Severodonetsk Donetsk in recent weeks as they look to make further gains in the eastern Donbas region. Ukraine has rebuked French President Emmanuel Macron for his remark that Russia should not be humiliated. Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleva said this comments can only humiliate France. Macron made the statements in an interview published.